Good morning. I'm glad you're taking a moment to uh, share in this moment of worship. And I do not believe there are any announcements at this time, so uh, we'll just dive right in. We're continuing looking at the Lord's Prayer for this uh, month, and probably a little bit longer. And so this, today we continue looking at uh, the same reading we have been. Pray then in this way, our Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of God for us, people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever been overseas? Have you ever been to another nation, another culture? If you have, I would like you to think about what it would be like to try to explain what that trip showed you. What did you learn about that culture to someone who never has been? What would it take? Stories, pictures, video. Could you really include enough details? Like, it's a challenge. Olivia and I went overseas uh, before children. We went to Italy, the two of us. And to try to explain what Italy is like to someone who has never been, I, I tried once or twice, and it just, there are so many details. There are so many aspects. The things that you expect to be surrounded by people who speak a different language is, it can be very overwhelming, very disconcerting. Uh, but there are so many things that were unexpected, like this trains. In Italy, you can just bop around the country using trains in a way that like, we just don't understand, we don't experience here. Things like air conditioning. When your buildings are centuries old, they weren't built for air conditioning. And so air conditioning is not anywhere near as common as it is in the United States. And just the old buildings, right? I live in a hundred year old house and that's old, right? Hundred, we measure old in decades. In Italy, they measure old in centuries. A hundred years is just warming up. That, that's nothing, right? Uh, and, and then these old buildings, like one of the things they're not set up for is uh, when you go to a restaurant and you order Coke or Sprite or whatever, it was what well, caught my attention, and it was just the smallest detail. But like, if you think of those little uh, when you go to a concession stand and they have that little rolling thing that you can get Coke from, and it's hooked up to those, the tanks, that, that's what I saw at all the restaurants to serve Coke or Sprite or, or, or soda, because these restaurants were in ancient buildings and they weren't set up to have things like a place to put a brand new soda machine. It's just all of these details. And how long would it take for me to explain an entire culture, an entire nation, an entire politics, an entire way of life, this whole way of life that we call Italy, right? And we, we, there we'd have to get into things that I haven't even touched on, things like the history. Italy was not unified. Italian unification uh, was through the 19th century and wasn't finished until 1870. Italy, as we know it today, didn't exist until 1870. And so there are still deep divisions between the various parts of Italy, the various uh, city-states. They spent most of their history as city-states, not as one nation. And, and so just how does that impact them today? And, and, and I don't really know all, all that all that well. I, there's a lot that I don't know about Italy. And so I think of this when Jesus is talking to his disciples about the kingdom of God. Like when Jesus is explaining to his disciples and teaching his disciples uh, what to pray for, he teaches them what you pray for is thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? That, that's the next part of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about a kingdom. We're talking about God's will being done, which that's what happens in a kingdom. One person's will is done, and, um, and that is all-encompassing and impacts all parts of life, language and culture and business and politics and everything. And so what it is that we are praying for is 
is vast. It's more than we can describe. In the same way that I can't, some, I just somehow can't get enough details across to you to explain what it's like to be in Italy. In the same way, Jesus can't get enough details across to us for us to fully understand what this kingdom, this kingdom of God that is to come, what, what the kingdom of God is like. I can tell, it, he, he told the disciples bits and pieces and stories and, and moments, but it, it, it was never enough because you don't ever know fully until you get there. But Jesus starts anyways, because you got to start somewhere, right? And so Jesus tells them again and again that the kingdom of God has come near because Jesus is there with them. That it is time to repent, to turn, to turn towards the, and, and walk towards the kingdom now. To turn and follow me and, and let's embrace the ways of the kingdom and let's heal people. Let's teach people. Let's live together as a community that embraces everyone. Because the kingdom of God, what's coming near, it's not a way of thinking, it's a way of, of living. It's a way of living that we choose in the same way that we could choose to move to Italy and embrace an entirely different lifestyle, right? To, to be part of the kingdom of God, it's a way of life and it's a choice that we make to embrace this. And it takes the disciples years of following and listening and practice to begin to, begin to understand what this means. It's no different with us. We begin to understand the kingdom of God and it takes time. In fact, it takes a lifetime to, to understand as much as we can on this side of the kingdom. Right? The way that we begin to understand the kingdom of God, it, it begins by paying attention to Jesus. Always a good answer, but this is how. Jesus' Jesus's sermons always rooted in the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom, let me tell you about the kingdom, right? And, and, and we can look at Jesus and we can see that uh, how Jesus teaches. He teaches with parables, and the parables almost always start with the kingdom of God is like this, right? If you're listening to Jesus, he is almost always talking about the kingdom of God is like this. And we can look at how Jesus teaches and, and how when uh, the rich young man comes to Jesus and says, what should I do to have eternal life, to enter the kingdom? That's what the guy is asking about. And Jesus looks at him and says, here's what you need to do. And the guy turns around and walks away. And so we can see that in the kingdom, no one will ever be cast out, but you can choose to walk away. You have to choose to enter or you choose not to enter. Right? There are boundaries to this kingdom that are enforced by your own decision, and my own, our own decisions about what we are going to do. Right? We, we look at what Jesus teaches and we, what Jesus says, and, and when Jesus is uh, talking to Pilate right before he is crucified, he says, my kingdom is not of the type that is of this world. Right? This, my kingdom is not the type of kingdom that you know. My kingdom is not a politics. It's not a way of doing things that's like you, you know because you're of the Roman Empire and the way you know to do things is to get your way and if you have to, use violence. And, and Jesus' kingdom is a peaceable kingdom. It's a kingdom that never resorts to violence for he is the king of peace. We can look at what Jesus teaches. We can look at what Jesus does, how Jesus feeds the 5,000. And so we know something about the kingdom, that it, the kingdom is, a, there's always going to be an abundance there, that, that when we are sharing out of God's abundance, there will be enough. How uh, We can look at Jesus heals lepers so they can rejoin the community. Right? In Jesus' kingdom, the kingdom that is to come, Jesus' politics, there is nobody who is outcast. Right? Everyone is welcome in. Whether they choose to enter is their decision, but all people are welcome. We can see in the climax of Jesus' life, when Jesus dies uh, on the cross, he is confronting death and he is resurrected. And we can see that the way of this kingdom is a, that it can face even death and that this kingdom can endure any challenge. I, I could say a lot more. I mean, you start talking in the way we know about the kingdom. You look at what Jesus teaches, what he does, and what happens in, in the Holy Week. Like, we could spend hours and hours and hours talking about that. But I think that's kind of how, how we do it. Like, we spend, this life, we spend a lifetime paying attention to what Jesus says and does and what happens in Jesus' life. And the more we pay attention, the more we notice the small details and, and we sort of marinate in them. And so we start to pick up all the small details that we can pick up about what this kingdom to come, what it is like. Because there's always more details to tell you. Right? I can always tell you more about Italy. The coffee. Oh my, the coffee in Italy was so good. 
So good. You can get Italian coffee around here, and I highly recommend it. Lavazza, really good coffee. Um, but I think you get the point. To learn about the kingdom is something that takes a while, and we're only going to fully understand it when we get there. In the same way, I can tell you about Italian coffee all you want, want all I want, but you got to go there to drink it, right? In the same way, we got to get to the kingdom to, to experience it in its, its fullness. And so we're, we're not going to know until we're there. We're not going to know the fullness of it until we're there. And that kind of gets us to this next part of it, right? We pray, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. As in, it's on the way, but it's not here yet. It has drawn close. Now, Jesus says it. The kingdom has come near. And so, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the kingdom has come near. And we can experience glimpses of the kingdom and the gathering of the disciples of Jesus to faithfully worship, live, and serve together. But it's not here fully. And so we understand that to be a disciple of Jesus, praying this prayer is to be learning ever more about that kingdom and to live a life that is sustained by hope for what is to come. We live sustained by this hope, this faith that the kingdom is coming and frustrated that it's not here already. We live in this tension between what is and what will be. And what does it mean that the kingdom, kingdom is not yet here? How do we understand that? There are books upon books upon books of people trying to grapple with this, right? And so we can look at, I mean, some of the options, uh, I will say up front, we're still, we're, we don't fully understand, but I, I'll, I mean, we can, some people will argue that the kingdom is on its way and that it's an evolving thing. Like it, we're getting there gradually, day by day, we're getting more and, and closer and, and we're going to get there and it's just one step at a time. And if you ever hear the phrase, the long arc of history bends towards justice, that, that's that sense of it, that we're going somewhere in the long arc of history. We're going to get there because history bends towards justice and we're getting towards the kingdom of God and we're on our way let's just get through today and follow Jesus faithfully one more day right, that's one approach to understanding the kingdom uh, another way to understand the kingdom of God is not that it's coming gradually but it's going to come all at once bam right big thunder clap a cataclysmic event and, and all of a sudden every knee will bow, bow and that will be that right and, and um, there are people who will talk about the kingdom of God like that there's the people People who talk about the kingdom of God, how it already has begun in the disciples of Jesus, and so we're already experiencing the kingdom to a degree as we come together, and then it is still on its way. It's sort of trying to hold together uh, both it has started and, and it's coming, and it could be coming gradually, it could be coming suddenly. We could, some people talk about the kingdom of God as this experienced reality that each person has to choose, right? And so we can... I can talk about this at length too, but I, I think the, the main point is to be able to hold on to this, that um, the kingdom is coming, Jesus is expecting, he's told us to expect it, Jesus expects it, and, and, and it's coming, and the details, well, I'll tell you when we get there, because that's when we'll know. Knowing that we are going somewhere, even if we're not sure on the details, is what helps us develop a faithful response to our current situation. Whatever our current situation is, right? Knowing where we're going helps us under, be able to respond to where we are. For we can see the differences between what Jesus describes and lives and embodies, right? And we can see the differences between what Jesus is showing us and where we are today. And we can name those differences. Because our salvation is not wrapped up in anything that is today. Our salvation is wrapped up in something that happened 2,000 years ago. And is based upon the kingdom that is coming. Our salvation is, is heading towards the kingdom that is coming. There's only one politics that is eternal. There's only one kingdom that will last forever. Right? And so there is nothing today that is going to be permanent. And so if we critique it because we say that this falls short of the glory of God, that's okay. Because this, our hope is not in any modern thing that's happening today. And so we can look around and we, we want to start making a list of the things that fall short of the glory of God. And not all children are cherished. Not all marriages are beautiful. The elderly are not cared for as they need to be. Race still becomes a way to judge people and look down upon them. Like we can make this list at great length. Right? And so knowing that we are heading towards the kingdom where thy will is going to be done. Thy will 
will, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We know that these matters will be resolved and healed, and we can lean into that and become part of that ourselves in a peaceful way, right? remembering that Jesus' kingdom is a peaceful kingdom. We never need to resort to violence because Jesus will get his way because Jesus is the king of kings and it's going to work out. And if it hasn't worked out yet, then we're not to the kingdom. I mean, we're, we're going to get there, but Jesus did not have to... Uh, Jesus overcame suffering by going through it, and we can learn from that. We're, we are praying for God's will, and we're heading towards God's kingdom, and we can do it in a peaceful fashion. We don't know the timeline, but we do know that Jesus was certain enough of the coming of the kingdom that he could walk towards the cross. Right? And I think that's just the amazing statement of, of where, how we live too, how we are called to live. Jesus was certain enough of what was coming that he could walk towards the cross, knowing that there was something on the other side, something perfect and better, the kingdom that is to come. And so we, in the same way, we pray for the kingdom, we live towards the kingdom, we follow Jesus in walking towards the kingdom, being reminded as we read the words of Jesus again and again what this kingdom looks like. How it, what it tastes like, what it feels like. Right? We attend to the words and the actions of Jesus so we might learn what it is that our king desires, what it is that our king wants, what our, how our king leads in this kingdom, and we can walk towards it today. Amen. Let us pray. Lord and King, thy kingdom come. We don't know all the details of your kingdom, yet we pray, as you taught us, thy kingdom come. And so we, open, we pray that you'd open our eyes, that in looking towards you, we might know more about this kingdom. Even as we know that we cannot know it fully until we stand before you, having arrived in it. And so we pray not for complete understanding, for we know that is not possible, but instead we pray for complete confidence, sufficient faith such that we might be able to follow you, seeing that you were able to walk towards the cross confident in your future, might we be able to do the same, knowing that your future is ours. We continue also to pray for this nation in this time as the news continues to be a litany of that which is depressing and challenging. We lift up to you our concerns, praying for health, for peace, reconciliation. Not that problems are ignored and glossed over, but that they are engaged and resolved, that people listen and understand and are able to serve. During this time, we also pray for those for whom life goes on. We pray for those who are having cancer surgeries, pray for those preparing for children to be born, we pray for those beginning new jobs, we pray for those moving, we pray for churches that are welcoming new pastors this next Sunday. We pray for all these things that continue to go on in the midst. And finally, we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ be with you this day and always. Amen.